So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we are having uh, Hunter Watson for a speaker today. Hunter Watson is a PhD candidate at the National University of Singapore, working under the supervision of Professor <coughs> John Nixick. His primary research area is Thailand and surrounding countries. His main interests are epigraphy and archaeology. Hunter holds an MA in Oriental Epigraphy from Silapatwan University in Bangkok, <coughs> and where he studies Sanskrit, Khmer, and Mon, and the development of ancient scripts in South and Southeast Asia. His doctoral research is an investigation of the Tawarawati and neighboring cultures, with a focus on script development and art artifacts, including the Machakras, Sema stones, votive tablets, coins, and ceramics as well as settlement patterns and interaction sphere in ancient mainland Southeast Asia. And we, uh, we were pleased to have you today, and thank you for staff of the Southeast Asian Academic Program for funding this event. Please uh, welcome Hunter. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that all of you could make it here this evening, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come present my research for you. In the back, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, if I get too quiet, just flag and I'll try to speak a little um, more loudly. So, um, we're going to talk tonight about um, the first millennium of Thailand. Uh, and I'll, I'll be speaking about Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. And I understand that it's a bit anachronistic to use these terms because, of course, these nations didn't exist in the first millennium. But I'm going to use these words nevertheless just to make it convenient when I'm talking about the geographical spaces. So, we look at the, the history of Thailand. Um, really, the earliest Thai kingdoms, we, we generally view them as being around the 13th century. And um, everything before that is seen as the pre-Thai period, which of course most Thai scholars tend to pay less attention to. They're more interested in Super Thai and Ayutthaya and what came after that. Um, but the few centuries before this are often referred to as the Lopburi period in Thailand, um, mainly because they don't want to call it the Khmer period. But the art and iconography in that period, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is, is uh, more related to the Khmer cultural sphere. Um, before that, we call the Tawarawadi period, uh, and the dates of the Tawarawadi period haven't really been nailed down. There's a lot of debate about what it is, and it's usually identified uh, as being related to the Mons, or the Mon ethno-linguistic group. But there's a lot of debate about Tawarawadi. What was it? When was it? Where was it? Um, scholars debate about which terms to use when they refer to it, and um, how big it was, and how cohesive it was of a society. And also, scholars debate about you know exactly where the center of it was, or if it had a center. And so this evening, I won't be answering these questions, but I'm going to try to explicate the debates on this topic a little bit for you, and uh, tell you a little bit about Mon inscriptions in Thailand. So um, for my impression, and I say here my current impression, because as I learn more and more, I allow my ideas to, to be flexible. You know, I, I don't want to be inflexible, so when I find new evidence, that indicates something different than what I thought before. I'm happy to change my ideas on it. Um, what I think now is that Tawarawadi um, was a specific urban center. I think it was a specific site, and I think it was quite possibly at Nakhon Um I think that Tawarawadi use, we use as a term to refer to a cultural sphere of sites on the lower central plain of Thailand, which had a very similar um, material culture, and I think that it dates um, roughly to the second half of the first millennium. So again, uh, my name is Hunter. I'm from the United States, but I've been living in Thailand for about 15 years. Uh, and I did an MA in, uh, at Salapakon University in epigraphy. And after that, my Thai professor said, leave Thailand. And so I didn't want to go too far. And so I went to Singapore. Um, and I'm currently um, working on a PhD at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I'm in the Department of Southeast Asian Studies, but as she mentioned, I'm focusing more on um, archaeology. Uh, and the focus of my dissertation, uh, I still want to work a lot with inscriptions. So I'm looking at the development and the spread of scripts around Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia in the first millennium. And I'm also looking at other types of art artifacts um, and some of my patterning and uh, ceramics and, and other things that will kind of help to contextualize the spread of writing throughout the region. So Tawarawadi. This is a Sanskrit term. Tawar means door. And... For those of you who haven't studied Sanskrit, you might see that Tuar and Dor are strikingly similar phonetically. And this is easy to explain because Sanskrit and English are both in the Indo-European language family. 
and there are actually a lot of cognate words between these two languages. Wapi is a feminine case ending name that we see for goddesses and for rivers and for sites um, all throughout South Asia and Southeast Asia. So some people try to translate Tawarwadi as a, a gated city or a place which is a gate into something. Uh, I don't think this is really necessary. I don't think there's any need to try to um, say, oh, this name implies that it was a site that had walls and a gate, even though if it, you know, if it was an important center, it may have had some sort of fortifications. But I don't think this is necessary because a lot of other ancient place names in the region um, of Sanskrit origin have other meanings which we don't take literally. So Amaravadi was not an immortal city. You know, we think of Singapore, Simha, you know, the lion city. We know there, there were no, no lions in Southeast Asia. So, for example, Singapore and Singapore were not places where they had lions. Petroburi is not a location where we find diamonds, and it's not a lightning city. And so the same thing with Tawarawadi. I don't think there's any need to take it literally. On the contrary, Sanskrit was a prestigious language in the past. And so Sanskrit place names were borrowed into Southeast Asia to, you know, to raise the significance of these sites. And many of the place names that we find in Southeast Asia are repeats of places which were already used in India. And even in the Southeast Asia, in the region of Southeast Asia, these place names got repeated. And so from inscriptions, we have seen the name Tawarawadi um, in records in what is now Myanmar and in Cambodia, referring to sites which we don't associate with Tawarawadi in Central Thailand. And so, in fact, we can talk about multiple Tawarawadis in ancient Southeast Asia. Of course, today we're just looking at the one in Thailand. But um, so here, um, I created a digital elevation model of Southeast Asia. So we're looking at the, the topography of the region because I think this will help contextualize uh, where I'm going forward from this. This here is known as the Central Plain. So it's a relatively flat flood plain in Central Thailand. This is the Karat Plateau. In Thailand, it's usually called Isan, um, but I prefer to refer to it by the geographical region of the Karat Plateau. Uh, the reason being is that when we refer to Isan in Thailand, it stops at the Thai border, Mekong River. But actually, the Korat Plateau geographical region extends well past the river into lowland Lao. And many of the artifacts and the objects that we find related to the ancient culture on the Korat Plateau, they're found in both what is now Thailand as well as in what is now Lao. And so I just look at this as a cohesive area of the Korat Plateau. We've also got the Chiang Mai Lampun Basin uh, in northern Thailand, which is the largest uh, river basin in the north and therefore was you know, a convenient place in the past for large scale um, agric agriculture. And then in southern Thailand, we have the peninsula region, which I'll, I'll touch on just briefly. So the main two cultures which scholars think about when we talk about monoscriptions in Thailand are Tawarawadi and Haripun Chai. But again, Tawarawadi is debated. Some people say it was in central Thailand. Some people say central and on the Korat Plateau. Some people even include northern Thailand. And some scholars even like to throw the peninsula region into the mix. And so there's a variety in the spatial expanse of what people think was Tawarawadi. There's also debate about what sort of society it was. And the root of this really comes down to the art historians and the archaeologists. Because the art historians and the archaeologists are looking at different things. And so when they look at the thing they're setting and they say the Tawarawadi period, that may not match the period set forth by the other field of social scientists. Then Hari Punchaya, there's less debate about. Hari Punchaya uh, was a later kingdom in a uh, kingdom, I use loosely, of course, um, in northern Thailand here. So looking at inscriptions in Thailand, we find inscriptions written in, in a variety of languages. Um, most of these are in Thai Khmer, Mon Sanskrit, and Bali. Of these, the majority are in Thai Khmer, Sanskrit, and Bali. And it is for this reason that most people in Thailand who study inscriptions, they prefer to study these languages. When I was doing my MA, my paleography professor pointed out that there were quite a number of old Mon inscriptions that had been found. People weren't studying them. Most Thai students tended to not be interested in them because it's a small corpus of texts, and also Mon is not a state language today. And so if they graduate and aren't working with epigraphy, it's hard to find work with Mon language. So my professor said, Hunter, why don't you study these? Because no one else is working on it. <laughs> and so I said, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so let's look at Mon inscriptions. So again, just a, you know overview here. We've got Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Mon inscriptions we find in six different geographical areas three of them in modern Myanmar, and three of them in modern Thailand. And when I began my study, I said, I'm going to study all of them. And my MA supervisor said, slow down. He said, you know, let's narrow the scope down. 
because I was limited in time. He said, let's just focus on what's in Thailand first. And so there are a lot of Old Mon inscriptions in Myanmar. I haven't studied them too in depth, and my presentation today will just be focusing on the evidence we found in Thailand. So in Thailand, we can basically break Old Mon inscriptions into three different temporal periods. Um, we, most of the Mon inscriptions in Thailand are not dated, but we date them approximately based on the script style. These script styles are referred to as the Pallava script, the post Pallava script, and the Old Mon script. Here I've put all these in quotation marks because these terms are all highly controversial. And epigraphers these days are all debating on why we use these names and what other names would be better, and everyone argues about any suggestion that's made, so we're kind of at a stalemate at the moment. Pallava script, of course, is making a reference to the Pallava kingdom in South India. The earliest script styles all throughout Southeast Asia, maritime and mainland, were very similar to scripts of South, of South India. Um, and in the past, the connection was drawn most closely to the Pallava kingdom, but it's not actually accurate because they also display similarities to other scripts from South India. Uh, and also it's misleading because the Pallava script was a script used in South India, which had a different history of its own. And so when we say the Pallava script in Southeast Asia, it's actually kind of a misnomer by trying to identify these two together. As it developed from that, we call it the post Pallava script, which is not really appropriate for the same reasons. And then Mon script is also not really inappropriate because the script that was used for the, um, the later Mon inscriptions was also later used for Burmese, etc. And so it wasn't just used for the old Mon language. Now the scripts we can break here, basically the 6th to 7th century, the 8th to 10th century, and 11th to 13th century. In the first period, you notice inscriptions were only found on the central plain. In the second period, they're found on the central plain and on the Korai Plateau. And on the third period, they're found only in northern Thailand. So just to give you something to look at, um, the earliest script style, the script tends to be more elegant and we can say like more cursive. A lot of the letters have longer features and have more decorative designs. In the second phase, there's a great simplification of the script style in general. And by the third phase, they begin to take a very round shape which leads us to the later Mon script. This is an image from a, a manuscript. And um, for any of you who have looked at Burmese, you'll notice it's very similar. The Mon script and Burmese script are almost identical. Um, some differences are with the subscripts. Some of the subscripts are a little bit different. Um, the Burmese script is often described as like circles or bubbles. And I read in so many places that these scripts were so-called bubble scripts because straight lines would tear through the manuscript. And I don't know who started saying that, but I don't agree with that because even this script style has straight lines. And if you look at other languages which are used in palm leaf manuscripts in Southeast Asia, they have straight lines also. So I'm not sure who started that, but I don't think it's, it's justified to say that it's just because straight lines would break through the paper. So to give you a map to look at here, in the first period, you see that old Mon inscriptions uh, are on the lower central plane and more off on the Western side. By the second period, they kind of spread a little bit more on the central plane and then far to the northeast onto the Karat Plateau and extending into Laos. And then by the third period, we find an isolated pocket in the Chiang Mai Lumpun Basin. While I'm on it, I'll note Nakhon Si Tamarat in the peninsula region of southern Thailand. And I mention this here because there are two inscriptions from Nakhon Si Tamarat, which Thai epigraphers in the 1980s identified as Old Mon. And their claim has been repeated and repeated and repeated. And because of this, anyone who talks about Tawarawadi I should say anyone, most people who talk about Tawarawadi, they include Southern Thailand. And they include Southern Thailand based primarily on the claim that there are old Mon inscriptions found in Southern Thailand. There are only two, and I can tell you unequivocally, they are not Mon. They were <laughs> misidentified in the 80s, okay? And so any claim that says Tawarawadi was in the South, it may be valid, but you need to judge it based on all the evidence that's there, not based on the claim of the old Mon inscriptions. Um, so I've given presentations where I've said this before. There are no mon, old Mon inscriptions in, the, in southern Thailand. And then in the q and I have people stand up and say, oh, so you're saying there were no Mons in the south. And I said, I, I said no such thing. I said that we have not found any inscriptions which were written in Mon. So there could be. Maybe we haven't found them yet. But the ones that were identified in the past were misidentified. They're not old Mon. So let's just get that out there. I have identified a little over 100 artifacts in Thailand inscribed in old Mon. So here I'm standing next to it for scale. This is one of the largest ones, and this one's quite large. It doesn't end here. It goes actually into the base that it's standing here. Uh, this one's large, and it has a writing on two sides of it. 
Um, this one on the right here is about the size of your thumbnail. So it's a little ceiling. It only has two words. Okay. And so the point that I want to make here is that although I have identified over a hundred artifacts in Thailand inscribed in Mon, don't get this idea that there's a hundred big stone inscriptions. Okay. Most of them are very, very short messages. There are only a few of them which are large like this. And so whereas, for example, when we think about inscriptions in Cambodia, the Khmer's produced a lot of really large inscriptions, very long inscriptions on door jams or on stele. Um, for Mon, that's not the case, at least not in Thailand. There, there are very few large um, stele, and most of them tend to be either small artifacts or large artifacts with small or short inscriptions written on them. So for those of you who don't know anything about studying inscriptions, we tend to make ink rubbings or estampage, where we take paper and we put it on the inscription and spray some water and then spread ink on it. And we do that because we don't take the inscriptions back with us to study at the university, but we can take the rubbings. Um, you know, the inscriptions, we leave them on site or at the temple or at the museum or something like that. Sometimes the inscriptions are not too clear, and by making an ink rubbing, it can actually be a little bit easier to read them. And so if I have access to an ink rubbing, I photograph the ink rubbing. If I can find the actual inscription, I photograph the inscription. Because sometimes the inscription's more legible than the rubbing, and sometimes vice versa. And so if if possible, I like to have images of both. And that way I can compare between them when I'm making my proposal on, on a reading of the message. Another technique that we use when looking at inscriptions is to take chalk powder and smear it onto the inscription and then clean it off except for what's in the letters. I think the mouse is on screen there a little bit. Um, this is useful because when, when letters are carved into the stone, actually the letters are the same color as the stone, so they don't always stand out clearly. But by using chalk powder like this, it can make the letters stand out quite noticeably. And if you see inscriptions in museums that are white like this, that's chalk powder. Okay, so a few pictures for you to look at. In the first period, um, not so many inscriptions, again, only on the central plane. And as I flip through my pictures, I want you to remember what I said about the messages being very short. Uh, this one, we don't know how large it was because it's broken on four sides. So it's a fragment from like the middle of the inscription. It has writing on both sides, but we don't have a whole lot of content from this one. This is at um, the mouth of a cave in Sarabri. It's a three-line inscription. This one's actually quite interesting. It talks about a, um, a local ruler and his queen having a procession with the villagers singing and dancing and going to the cave for some sort of ceremony. But it's only three lines. It's quite short also. Um, and then a lot of the inscriptions look something like this, Boon, and a person's name. So somebody got merit for something. We don't know what because they didn't tell us. We just They just told us someone got merit. Um, a lot of the Mon inscriptions tend to be like this. So here's one on the, uh, the base of a statue, and it's just a one-line text that um, I think it has to do with, like, maybe a prince having a dedication for after his father passed away. In the second period, we find a few different types of artifacts inscribed. So this is a um, um, uh, what's often called a votive tablet or a, a, like a clay ceiling. Um, and so that's my hand. You can see it's quite small. It's only about this large. And on the back, it has two short lines of text. This artifact is often called a miniature stupa, although some people debate exactly what it's meant to represent. Some people think it was a finial, but I don't think so. Um, and this has two lines of text, you see, on top. The first line and the first half of the second line is a Bali uh, Yetamakata. Uh, and then there's a short, followed by a short inscription in Mon that says that the ruler got married for building a Wihara. This one's interesting because when I went around to museums around central Thailand, I found a lot of these artifacts. And at some of the museums, I asked them, what is this? Where is this from? And they say, we don't know. When we founded the museum, the Bangkok Museum sent it to us. We're not sure what it is. Um, so when I photographed all these artifacts and started reading them, they all had the same message. And almost all of them had the same handwriting. And so I actually published a paper on this group because I think not only did they all originate in the same place, but I think they made them all for the same occasion. Uh, there's actually a large number of these that have been found that don't have inscriptions, uh, but they're all about the same size and shape. There's also a few similar looking ones from the Compaton, but they're much larger and they're not inscribed in Mon. So clay ceilings is the one I showed you before that's quite small. Um, and then this one's a nice uh, uh, octagonal pillar from Lopery. Uh, it's not so short message. It has four messages in total. There's two that you can see on this side and another two messages on the opposite side. And then on the Karan Plateau, we see a lot of these Sema stones, which might have one line of text or maybe three lines of text or four lines of text, but not a lot. It's short messages, generally just saying that such and such got merit for doing something. 
Again, here's one that has uh, one line and then a couple letters of a second line. Some of the Sema stones are decorative, decoratively carved. This one has, um, has a motif on top, and then in the center here you see a larger figure and a smaller figure seated. And below them there are two lines of text, which I've uh, enlarged up top here. And then there's this Sema stone also, which is the only Mon inscription in Thailand which has a numerical date, um, which neatly fits right into what we would classify paleographically 8th to 10th century, and this is the 8th century. Um, there are a few of the other Mon inscriptions from northern Thailand that have dates, but not numerical dates. It has astrological dates. So this is the only like clear date that we have written on a Mon inscription in Thailand. On the Karai Plateau, we also have a number of these clay ceilings. This one's about, about 10 centimeters tall. And on the back, it has an inscription, not etched, but written with like red, um, a red pigment or red paint of some sort. Um, and most of these, the, the paint is uh, kind of worn off. But I plan to go back to the museum and try to take uh, new photographs and maybe process it with de-stretch and see if I can pull the color out a little bit more. We found a lot of these. They're all from the same site, all from Mahasada Kham. In the third period, again, inscriptions we only found in the north. They tend to be quite large. This is where we find the real nice ones that have a lot of content for us to study. So again, this is the same one. On the left is the inscription, on the right is the ink rubbing. Uh, in the north, we also find some clay tablets. These are also these are about 12 centimeters tall. It has a one-line inscription on the bottom, which is the name of a monk or a figure from, um, from uh, Buddhist literature. And several of these have been found, and the name on every one of them is a different name. So, um, summarizing the old Mon inscriptions in Thailand, they're predominantly Buddhist in nature. Primarily, they're records of donation and merit making. Um, and I say primarily because a few of them, like the one that's a ceiling, it could just be someone's personal name. So it doesn't necessarily have um, a connotation of a Buddhist merit making. But when I say predominantly and primarily, I mean like 98%, okay? Almost all of them are Buddhist and they're about merit making and donations. Quite a few of them list names because, of course, the people who's doing the mer meritorious act, they want to have their name recognized. Um, in a few of them, we have place names, and I think this is interesting because there aren't a lot of place names from the first millennium that we have the names for. Uh, and there haven't been many people that have been looking at these place names, and so I'm actually working on a paper on this topic now. There are a few references in these northern Mon inscriptions which uh, refer to historical events. Two examples, there's reference to an earthquake and a subsequent renovation of a stupa, which was damaged in the earthquake. And there's also reference to a religious ceremony where they took a floral umbrella and a palm leaf, mar um, palm leaf manuscript and interred these into a cave. But based on the wording of the text, it might not actually be like a cave. It might have been some sort of building that they made. But the name is can be translated as a cave. And so <laughs> it's not really clear. But I think this one's kind of interesting because... We can almost visualize it. They talk about a floral umbrella and a palm leaf manuscript. And even today, floral umbrellas are still produced in northern Thailand on mulberry paper. And all over Southeast Asia, we're familiar with palm leaf manuscripts. So it's not something that's so far away that we can't picture it. It's also interesting because um, these palm leaf manuscripts, if you take really good care of them, you might get them to last for two or three centuries. But of course, from 800 years ago, they would have disintegrated. But from the inscription, we know that they did have palm leaf manuscripts at that time. They were already producing them. The word that they used in the inscription is the same word that is used in modern Mon. So again, um, I found over 100 artifacts in Thailand um, inscribed in Old Mon. And this number continues to increase when I go to museums and I find other things which haven't been published. Um, there are some inscriptions in Thailand which have been identified as other languages. For example, Sanskrit, and then when I study them, I think they're actually Old Mon, and so that could add to this number. And then there are a few inscriptions in Thailand which other scholars have claimed are Mon, which I think are not. Most notably, the two from the south, which I already mentioned, I do not think are Mon, and other people don't think they are either, but there are some people that will hold on to that and continue to argue it. So, moving on to some debates about Tuarawadi. What was it, when was it, and where was it? And another question that I want to ask is, is it appropriate for us to identify Tawarawadi with the ethno-linguistic group of the Mons, which is something that's really prevalent in all the literature, and I don't think it's justified. And so I'm going to try to share some of my thoughts with you on this topic. If you go onto the internet and you do a Google search of Tawarawadi, you will find this image. I don't know where it came from. Um, 
it's a little hard to agree with, but this is what I would say the general population thinks when they think of Tuarawiti. If you go to the Bangkok National Museum, they have a map of Tuarawiti sites. And I took this on my phone, so it's not real clear, and so I recreated this map in ArcGIS. Uh, and here you see, of course, I've marked the, um, the Parapolit Korat Plateau in yellow, and I've dropped points everywhere here that they mark points, and you see there's a cluster in the lower central plain, and then across the Korat Plateau, and then they've included Hari Chai, and they've included southern Thailand. So this is the official stance of the Fine Arts Department of Thailand. This is what they call Tawarawadi sites, and this is what most archaeologists in Thailand would argue are Tawarawadi sites. Again, the one on the internet doesn't exactly match it. This one here doesn't include the south. It also includes some areas that they don't account for here. So not consistent in, in what it was or where it was. There is high inconsistency with the terms that people use when they refer to Tuarabudi. Um, early on, they were saying it was an empire, and then they said it was a kingdom, and then a state. And sometimes you'll find a work that in like within two sentences, they'll use three or four. It was a kingdom or a state or an empire. I think that the question here is not about what exactly it was. I think it's more a question of how do you define these terms? Because I've noticed that in all of these texts, when they call it an empire or they call it a kingdom, they don't follow up by defining what they mean by a kingdom. And most of these words have loaded meaning. And so if I say, okay, I'm going to call it a culture, but I mean a culture in this sense, well, then you'll understand why I'm calling it a culture. But if I just say a culture and then you think, well, what does culture mean for you? Well, everyone in here could have a different opinion about what exactly that is. And so I think part of the problem here is that people toss these words around without defining them. Another one, okay, I'll just mention here, I don't think it was an empire because it wasn't consolidated enough. It wasn't centralized like the Khmers were. I don't identify it as an ethno-linguistic group, which I'll move to in my next point. And I don't really think we can call it a state either because, again, it wasn't centralized. It doesn't seem it was cent seem to have been centralized. I think Tuarawadi was more specifically a site. But I prefer not to use the word city because it also has a bit of a loaded meaning with some implications. I prefer to use the word or the term urban center. Um, I think city also, if you were to call something a city, you have to define what exactly is a city in your terminology. How big is it? What's the population? What's the connectivity with other sites? Tawarawadi period, we hear a lot, but there are different Tawarawadi periods depending on if it's art historians or archaeologists or paleolinguists. And these don't match up in temporal span. And the Chinese records mention Tawarawadi, but the Chinese records only to mention, mention Tawarawadi for about a 200-year period or so. But the art historians, the archaeologists, and the linguists all refer to Tawarawadi as being a larger span of time than that which, was, which is accounted for in Chinese records. And so, again, there's inconsistency here. And based on the actual evidence that we have for Tawarawadi, it seems that everyone else is taking it and stretching it into temporally something that we don't necessarily have justified. The earliest studies of Tawarawadi was, I think, really initiated by the French scholars who are working, of course, earlier in the, in the French Indochine uh, in Cambodia, and then they expanded into Siam. Um, Samuel Beale in 1884 was the first one to mention this. Um, studying Chinese texts, he found a word in Chinese text which he transliterate, transliterated as Tawarapadi in Sanskrit. He was suggesting that it was Sanskrit, a reference to a Sanskrit place name. In uh, 1901, Amonier made the first actual reference to an inscription in Thailand, which we now know is Old Mon, but Amonier didn't know that at the time, because at the time they didn't know there were Old Mon inscriptions. They knew there were Old Mon inscriptions in Burma, but not yet in Thailand. And of course, the French scholars weren't studying Old Mon. So Amonier identified this inscription. He said it's written in a pre Angkorian script, so it looked similar to what he was used to seeing in Cambodia but he didn't know the language. A couple years later, Paul Pelliot said that Tawarawadi, again, Paul Pelliot was referring to Tawarawadi that Samuel Beale had mentioned, which they didn't yet have solid evidence for. Paul Pelliot said that it may have been a polity, either Mon or Khmer, centered at Lombri. And about two decades later, Sadus was the first person that actually identified an inscription in Thailand as being written in Old Mon, and that was the octagonal pillar from Lombri. And Sadus argued that Labo was the center of Mon civilization. And I think this is really the point where the snowball starts to roll. Because after this, Prince Damrong proposed that Tuarawadi was a style of art. And then Sadas, who was working closely with Damrong, labeled all of the art across the lower central plain as the art of Tuarawadi. And then from there, it just gained momentum. LeMay in 38 said Mons were the dominant race on the central plain. 
1945, Griggs called Tuaroba the Amman Kingdom. And then in 1951, Sidon Fadden said that some sites on the Kara Plateau were also Mon. So um, I think in retrospect, there are a few things that we can see going on here. First off is the tendency early on to label Tuarawadi as something that was spatially large. Um, there was also a tendency for them to identify it with the Mon, Mon ethno-linguistic group and to talk about it in racial terms. And I think that we have to be a little bit reflective about the ways of thinking among late colonial era scholars, especially referring to things like nations and ethnicities or racial groups. And when we look at these early texts, especially LeMay, some of the things from our modern perspective of academics, it'll make your jaw drop, the way he talks about facial features and stuff like that. It's very loaded about their perception of race 100 years ago. Um, the first actual evidence we had that Tawarawadi was a place name in Thailand was with the finding of the first <coughs> Tawarawadi coin. And here we call it a Tawarawadi coin. Some people say, oh, it's not a coin because it wasn't used as a currency. We've only found it in, in um, like religious foundations and stuff like that. So some people try to call it a medallion. They don't want to call it a coin. Uh, for me, I don't think that's a very serious debate because we can speak about commemorative coins, which are struck for you know ceremonies but not used as currency. So I don't think that's too particular. So I call it a coin or a medallion, whichever one. So in 1964, there were two of these published, uh, two of these first published, and uh, Bill using Sadis's reading and translation of Sri Tawarawadi Swara Punya. Uh, Iswara is a lord. Sri Tawarawadi uh, can be a personal name or a place name. Sri, of course, is auspicious, and Boon is merit. And so this can be translated like the merit of the Lord of Tawarawadi. One thing that's notable about this, every publication you will read says that this is actually a Sanskrit message, which makes perfect sense because Sri is Sanskrit, Tawarawadi, Iswarabunya, all four words are Sanskrit. For me, I'm, I'm almost inclined to call it a Mon inscription. And that may sound counterintuitive, but all of these words would have been words which were borrowed into Old Mon. And from my experiences with studying ancient languages and languages in general, once a word is borrowed, it belongs to that language, even if it originated in another language. And so even though all of these words were from Sanskrit, once Mon borrowed in, and Mon would have used them as Mon words. Now, the reason I think that it might be Mon instead of Sanskrit is there's no conjunctions, there's no declensions, it's not following proper Sanskrit grammar, which is very abnormal. And so I'm more inclined to think it could be Mon. Um, any paper you'll read that mentions these calls them Sanskrit, but recently um, I've been working with Peter Skilling and he agrees that it's possible to consider it as a big old mine. So after this find, Sadis jumped back to his 1925 claim and he said, aha, here we have cold heart evidence. And Sadis said that Tawarwadi was a Mon population that spoke Mon as the vernacular. And since then, no one has really challenged him. It's just been repeated and repeated in the literature. These coins have been found a lot in the Central Plain, kind of scattered around. Um, most of them are in private collections, and we don't necessarily know that they're all authentic, and we continue to find more and more reports of these. Um, looking at where Tawarawadi was, there's actually two questions. Where was the urban center of Tawarawadi? Because I'm not inclined to think that Tawarawadi would have been the name that was used for like a kingdom or an empire, and a specific city would not have also had that name. You know, we see the tendency in Southeast Asia in the past that the name of a city gets projected to the larger society. And so I think Tuarwadi must have been a specific site. But then we can also uh, ask the question of what was the spatial extent for the culture for which it was a part of? And I say it that way because we don't necessarily know that Tuarwadi controlled all the spatial areas where we find material culture, which is related to, to Tuarwadi. So here's a distribution of where we have found the coins. Uh, and here on the map, I've actually used an image from the coin. And the reason I did that was because this map that I saw in the Bangkok National Museum had done that. They had actually taken images of points and marked these as their places. And I found this is misleading for two reasons. Because on the map in the museum, they say map of Tawarawadi sites, but they don't explain to you. When I first looked at this map, I said, oh, these are the places where they found coins. Well, that's not the case. That's not where we found coins. We've only found coins at this place. And it's also misleading because it includes mm -hmm. northern Thailand and southern Thailand, and there's a lot of debates about whether these were actually part of Tawarawadi. There is debate about where was the major urban center. Some people think it was Utong. Some people think it was Nakhon Patol. There's evidence that Utong was older, and it was certainly a very important site early on. And so, like, early in the first millennium, Utong may have been an important site, and then later in the first millennium, Nakhon Patol may have become a more important site. A lot of people tend to think it was Nakhon Patol because there's a lot more evidence of the Tuarawadi-style art from there, 
and also the site was larger. Uh, Karen Mudar, two decades ago, she did a study of moated settlement sites on the Central Plain, where she looked at the size of the moats. And looking at the size of the moats, she break them into a ranked hierarchy based on size. And among her ranked hierarchy, she identified five centers, which would have been large, she called them like large regional centers. And she identified Nakon Patom as by far the largest site. And so she said, if we have a ranked hierarchy based on the size of the moat alone, it would seem to indicate that Nakon Patom was the, the top dog in the region at that time. Um, there are some things which we can debate about her argument, but um, it does fit in with a lot of what a lot of other people think. And I tend to think that Nakompatom probably was the most important site in the late first millennium. So here, stars are the places where we have found coins. And again, here we have Utong and Nakompatom, both of which we have found Tuarawadi coins. On the map, I included here Lobri. At Lobri, we have not yet found any Tuarawadi coins. But I threw it up here on the map because a, some people argue that Lobri was Tuarawadi, or that Lobri was the most important site. I tend to not agree with this for the main reason that we have a coin that reads Lawapura. And Lawapura is quite clearly Lobri. You could debate it, but it's pretty similar. Okay. For those of you who haven't studied language, uh, um, uh, languages, uh, there could be free variation between what and put sound, and so that's not problematic at all. Um, but that leaves Utong and Nakopatom, both of which have yielded Tuarawadi coins. Um, there is other epigraphic evidence for the name Tuarawadi. This is a base of a standing Buddha statue, which is missing, of course, the rest of the statue. And here along the base, there's an inscription that mentions Tuarawadi. And this inscri inscription actually mentions the queen of Tuarawadi, which led some people to say, Mung Sema in the Kondratasima province, aha, that was Tuarawadi. Um, but this is not necessarily justified because it's talking about a queen of Tuarawadi. And so... Um, it's possible that rather than being the seat of power of Torawadi, we have, for example, a princess being in an arranged marriage with a ruler of Mung Sema for political reasons. Because it doesn't mention a king, it's mentioning a queen of Torawadi. Now, most recently, and some of you may not have heard this news yet, just about, I would say about five weeks ago, not quite, not, not, not two months ago, this is a new inscription which was just uncovered in the Kwanpatol, and it bears the name Torawadi. Okay, which is actually the first time that we found it written on something not a coin on the central plane. Um, again, the Kompatom is here. So based on this one, I, you know, again, I'm not 100% sure, but I tend to think that there, there's, there's a lot of evidence that's pointing towards the Kompatom being Tuarawadi. So um, looking back at this one, the spatial extent, and again, this is what the FAD proposes. I want to look at some other artifacts to think about here, specifically the Dharma Chakra and the Sama Stone, both of which are other types of artifacts which I'm looking at in my dissertation. Dharma Chakra, it, I'm sure you're all art historians in here, I don't have to explain this to you too much. It's the wheel of the law in Buddhism. It's representative of the first sermon of the Buddha and of the setting into motion of the teachings of the Dharma. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in this map here. But the main thing I want you to see is that Tuarawadi style, style Dharma chakras are found kind of scattered around the lower central plain, as well as in the Kondratasima, right at the corner of the plateau. We've also, um, reportedly, there was one found at Galassian in the center of the Karat Plateau. I can't confirm that. There's a, in Thai language, archaeological report from about the late 80s, I want to say, um, that mentions a Dharma chakra being found. But it's a mention based on hearsay of villagers. And I haven't seen a photo of it. I don't know where it is today. And as far as I know, I don't know anyone else who has seen it. And so it's more like a report of hearsay from villagers. So it's possible, but we don't know. In uh, Surat Thani, we have a fragment of a broken Dharma Chakra. Now, the hearsay of the Dharma Chakra on the Karat Plateau and the fragment of the one down here is evidence for some people that they say, oh, well, then the Karat Plateau in southern Thailand, they were part of Tuarawadi. And I think that's kind of getting ahead of you know, ourselves. I think that one piece is not indicative that it was part of the same cultural sphere. Clearly, they were in contact. It's possible that it was sent as a gift or it was purchased. I mean, we don't know, and that's something that would need to be discussed. But if we wanted to say that the southern region was related to the central plain because of the Dharma Chakra, I would say we would need to have more than one. The same applies for the, the Karat Plateau. So clearly, these areas were in contact. But I think that the isolation of the Dharma Chakras relatively to the central plain tends to indicate that Tuarawadi cultural sphere was probably, for the most part, on the central plain. If we look at Sema stones from Pali Sima, 
These were Buddhist boundary markers used around the outside um, of the ordination hall. Uh, and on the Korra Plateau, these are found in, in large numbers. Uh, many of them have like depictions of different Buddhist motifs. Uh, some of them are inscribed. And um, for those of you who don't know Stephen Murphy, graduating here in 2010, he did his PhD dissertation on Sama stones on the Korra Plateau. A lot of sites all over the Korra Plateau have these Sama stones as well as one at, at Phnom Kulan. There are two sites on Phnom Kulan Mountain, uh, which I don't think indicates a spread from, from Phnom Kulan. I think that the culture there, there were some monks from, from the Korra Plateau that came down and established um, temples at Phnom Kulan area. None have been found on the Central Plain. And so while some people say, oh, the Central Plain and the Korra Plateau were part of a single cohesive cultural group, I think the fact that the Dharma Chakra is being isolated, the Central Plain, and the same stones being isolated relatively to the crop plateau tends to indicate that these weren't a consolidated cultural sphere. These were two different cultures, is what I think at the moment. Something else that people use to justify the crop plateau being part of the central plain is the Mon language, Mon language inscriptions. Because the, of course, later there were Khmer language inscriptions on the crop plateau. But early on, we see these Mon language inscriptions. And people say, oh, Mon language up there, Mon language down here, that's one group. And Khmer down here, that's another group. But we need to back up a minute. Because on the central plane, we find inscriptions written in Mon and inscriptions in Bali. I don't want to say bilingual inscriptions, because most inscriptions in Southeast Asia, when we say bilingual, many of us, the first thing we think is written in one language and then the same message translated in another language. Those do, those are found in Southeast Asia, but they're very rare. Usually bilingual means like a short text in Bali and then an unrelated text in a local language. Maybe like the invocation or something's in Bali or Sanskrit followed by the actual message. On the central plane, we find inscriptions written in Mon, in Bali, or in Mon with Bali. In what's now Cambodia, we find Khmer and Sanskrit. On the Korat Plateau, we find Mon and Sanskrit, not Mon and Bali. And so again, if we want to say that the Korat Plateau was the same cultural sphere as the Central Plain, then we would have to explain away why they were writing in Sanskrit and not in Bali. Okay, so again, I don't tend to think that the Korat Plateau was the same cultural sphere as the Central Plain. So um, a few things to, to explain as I, I conclude. So I want to re-summarize my views on Tawarabudi at the point. I want to share some of my ideas of what may be the root causes for the debates about Tawarabudi, and also want to challenge these views about Old Mon being the vernacular in the region. So again, um, I think that Tawarabudi was a specific site. I'm, I think it was perhaps in Nkompetom. It seems convincing at this point. Um, I think we can speak of a Tawarabudi culture um, which is not necessarily the culture of Tawarabudi going out, but other places which had a similar and related culture to them, similar religious and social practices, similar material culture, which I think was isolated primarily to the lower central plain. We can also speak of Tawarabudi art, uh, but this is what people in the past tend to view as having some similarities to Tawarabudi. This one I'm a little bit more skeptical of because I think a lot of the Tawarabudi art, if we look at it closely, we can actually break it up into smaller subdivisions. So I don't think it's ne not necessarily a cohesive group. Now, for the cause of the debates about Tawarabudi, I think one of the main reasons that we have this debate is because we have almost no epigraphic records of other place names from the region from the first millennium. So we have a lot of archaeological sites, but we don't have place names. And if we compare that, for example, in Cambodia, in Cambodian inscriptions, we have a lot of place names. So we know this one's Ishanapura, Yasur Harapura. You know, we, don't, we know the names of sites, so we can kind of like fill in the map, the dots on the map, so we can write the names out for them. For ancient Thailand, we can't do that. We have almost no place names. So then, and the place names we do have, it's not easy to pin them down to a precise site. Like, for example, Tuarawadi. We don't necessarily know which site it was. So I think what happens is, since we don't have many place names, is the few place names we have, they tend to get absorbed and be used as the art styles or the kingdoms or the empires. And then they get projected to a wider region, you know, where, for example, if we had more place names, okay, if we knew the names of many urban centers, I think people wouldn't assume that Tawara would eat is as large as people think it is. Instead, if we knew the place name over here, and this was Tawarawadi, we would say, well, Tawarawadi went to here, and then that was their space. You know, it would be more subdivided based on the other names that we had to fill in the map. And also, if we had other place names, instead of seeing all these little slight similarities and saying, oh, they're all similarly Tawarawadi art, we would look at the slight differences and say, oh, this is Tawarawadi art, that's Lobbury art, this is whatever art. 
I think that it would be this case. Um, but since we don't have such place names, scholars in the past would tend to, tend to look at similarities and group things together and then use the only appellation that they knew, which was Tawarawadi. So basically, I think a major part of the debate is the fact that we don't have any place names. And so people just don't know how to refer to these things in the past. Now, this is something that I've really come on. And I want to say that I didn't come to the way my current position, I didn't come to easily. And my biggest opponent was myself because my MA thesis was old mon inscriptions and I was totally absorbed and I had all these grand ideas about what it meant. And the more I studied about old mon inscriptions, um, I'll say this, when I started my MA thesis, we knew of 36 inscribed artifacts in Old Mon. And by the end of my thesis, I knew over 100. And so for me, my own worldview of what Old Mon was had, had exploded. I found them in further geographic spaces and in larger numbers. And so, you know, it just grows and grows and grows. But then one day I sat back and I really thought about the length of them and the content of the message. And I think that there's a problem with the way that people took Mon and applied that to Tawarawadi and almost used them interchangeably. You know, they have a direct connection. And any work you read about Tawarawadi, for example, uh, Dupont in, I want to say, 1949, he published the, um, the name evades me, the, no, the, the title of his text, the book he wrote in like 1949, the, um, basically the Mon Art of Tawarawadi or something like that. Um, he makes a direct connection, and all these other scholars too, as I showed you early on, LeMay, Sedes, all of them, Sidon, Fadden, um, and even in modern, all the modern work from the 80s and the 90s and even more recently. When people speak about Tawarawadi, they speak about Mon interchangeably, and some people like Piri Akairich, he talks about Mon art, and so they just switch it out. When they don't want to say Tawarawadi anymore, for example, on the Karapla Tour in Northern Thailand, they just take that out and they use Mon instead, and I think this is a big problem. Because I think that these sorts of claims have gone forward without enough retroflexion as to why we started using Mon and Tawarawadi interchangeably. And I think the problem is that now what happens is anytime an inscription is found which is written in Mon, people assume that that location was included in the cultural sphere of what they consider Tawarawadi, and they also immediately conclude that, that Mon was the vernacular in that location. And I think both of these are suppositions which we shouldn't jump to lightly. And when some people jump to them, and then what happens is it gets cited and recited and recited and recited until all the literature says it, and no one actually stops and looks at why did we start calling it that. I think what happens is a little short inscription gets found, one line or two lines. And then people say the population was ethnically Mon, Old Mon was the vernacular, and the location is tied to other Tawarawadi locations, which makes sense for everyone who's not studying the inscriptions. They're just basing it on, on the evidence of an inscription being found. But I think that people forget to stop and look back at, at that location, how many inscriptions were found written in Old Mon? How large were those inscriptions? How much text? How many words were found in them? You know, How much evidence do we actually know that people in that location were using that language? And what extent does that provide towards the local vernacular? I think that a short text is not indicative of, of a vernacular. If we look at Cambodia, for example, again, we find lots of inscriptions, long inscriptions written in, in Khmer. For the Mons, we don't. You know, we find these little, like, one votive tablet written like that. Is that indicative of a society? Actually, no. That's only indicative of the person who made the object. So if we find one little Mon inscription, all we know is there's one person. And actually, that one person may not have been a native Mon user. You know, when I give evidence of it, like when I give presentations in Thailand, I point out, I wrote my MA thesis in Thai. Well, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, someone goes through the library and says, oh, here's a book written by Thai. It must have been a Thai person. Well, that's not the case. Anyone can learn a language, and especially if it's only one line, you don't even have to be fluent to write one line. And so such a short, short text cannot indicate for the whole society, and it can't even necessarily indicate for the person who made that object. So there's a few scenarios that we can imagine. <clears throat> You know, when we find old Mon texts in a site, we can say, okay, everyone there spoke Mon. Or we could say that maybe the ruling class spoke Mon and everyone else wasn't. Maybe they were a different group or maybe it was a diversity of group, which is what I tend to think. Even in recent times, as far as 100 years ago in Thailand, there were like over 100 different languages, languages and dialects. You know, and I'm sure a thousand years ago, it would have been as many or more. You know, we had a high multitude. It was a, 
especially Thailand, when we look at, at, at mainland Southeast Asia, it was a crossroads. People coming from different directions and passing through. There would have been a lot of languages, minority languages, majority languages, but it's hard to say for sure. And I think that it's possible that in some of these sites, maybe on the central plain, Mon may have been the vernacular, at least of the ruling class. But then, for example, on the Karai Plateau, maybe not, you know, maybe it was only in a classic in a ecclesiastic language, but not a spoken vernacular. So this is just sometimes when I try to think of different variations. And I think, for example, of the monastic literati. So we know in the past that most people probably couldn't read couldn't read and write, except for the monks. The monks can read and write. But in a classic language, is not a vernacular language. We know from all over these regions, we find inscriptions in Pali and Sanskrit, but we do not assume that the local population spoke these languages. Because we say, oh, these languages are from a foreign land. But we say, oh, Mon is from here. Oh, so there must be people who are here speaking Mon. Why does that have to be the case? It's easy to imagine, because all of these old Mon inscriptions we find, they're all religious. They're all about merit making. They're all about Buddhism. These were made by monks in a religious context. A literate monk doesn't represent the whole society. And even then, as is the case now, monks move around for study purposes. And so I can imagine a scenario, for example, let's say hypothetically, the Central Plain people did speak Mon, but the Karak Plateau they didn't. And you had monks from the Central Plain go through center up here, and the local ruler said, okay, I'm going to make merit, make an inscription for me. So you could have had a monk from the central plain that spoke Mon and a populace that didn't. Or even you could have had monks from the northeast that came down to the central plain and learned a little Mon and then they went back and they might not even have been fluent in the language. Because again, the texts we find are very short. Okay, so my point is that there's no evidence of other written languages before Khmer, of course, um, in ancient Thailand and the first millennium. We don't have any evidence of other written languages. So people tend to use that as the reason to say, okay, the population was Mon. But I don't think this is nearly is necessarily justifiable because we can't take the lack of something to give us the conclusion for something else. So in closing, I'm not saying that Mon was or wasn't the ancient vernacular. Okay, so the way I've been moving this, it almost sounds like I'm saying it wasn't the vernacular. And that's not what I'm saying. It may have been, maybe, okay. The Mons, if we want to talk about ethno-linguistic or racial groups or something, they may have been the majority in some or many of these sites. But my point is, I don't think any of things are necessarily the case. But when you look at the literature, they're all is like de facto, like obvious, you know, it's just repeated without being questioned. And so what I'm arguing is that there's an, a lack of evidence to support the commonly repeated claims about ancient ethnicity and language usage, which leads to further confusion and controversy. Again, part of this being because the early period of the studies of Tawarabadi and Mon began during the late colonial period, and the way we think about race and ethnicity and all these things, the states and societies, it's changed. And so we have to have a little bit of you know reflection when we look at all of these old texts on... The claims that they made, what were those claims based? What's the actual evidence we have to deal with? And that was the, you know, that's the pill I had to swallow in my studies was after studying Mon, I had to step back and say, maybe it wasn't the language. Maybe it wasn't the lingua franca. Maybe it wasn't the vernacular or something like that. But nevertheless, it is indicative of a cultural connection across the region. Um, and I do think there is merit to continue studying old Mon. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I assume you're taking questions. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really, really nice to see the recent connection. And, um, I, have, I have two questions for you. One is, can you can you walk us through the distinction which you seem to be adhering to between ethnicity on the one hand and language usage on the other, which is really a question about how do you define ethnicity? That's question number one. And then question number two is a little bit more complicated. Um, so if we were to go to your your example of, um, or your hypothesis of, uh, this is not an indication of vernacular usage necessarily. Mm -hmm. And we were to take the example, not of Sanskrit and Thali, but of Khmer, um, used by non-Khmer speakers, uh, which is perhaps a more pertinent example insofar as Sanskrit and Pali are these 
is in cosmopolitan languages, the Carian origins, etc. Khmer is perhaps more on the on the order of Hmong, perhaps in terms of is it cosmopolitan, is it vernacular in some sense. And um, so with Khmer, we have a fairly clear reason why it would be used by non non Khmer vernacular, non ethnic Khmer, whatever that means, non Khmer vernacular speakers. Um, because of hierarchies, because of prestige, et cetera, sort of taking the place of Sanskrit in that way. How about Hmong? Can it be, you didn't really use that as one of your possible modes of interpretation of Hmong usage. You talked about sort of traveling with monks, and, but does hierarchy play into it? And if so, how and why? And then you can begin to write your grand narrative about polity. I don't, um, um, well, thank you. And first about ethnicity and language, that, that is a very tricky question. And that's not something that I've been focusing on specifically. And I don't think that language is necessarily tied to ethnicity because, of course, ethnicity can be defined in a variety of terms like uh, social practices or burial practices or food practices or a number of things. And, and I think that language is not necessarily tied to that, indicative of that. But what we see in the literature is that that distinction isn't made. They see the old Mon language and they identify that as ethnicity. And the early colonial era scholars, they went specifically to race. They would say racial group. This is this is the dominant racial group. Not even dominant. They would, you know, and sometimes they'd say it was a Mon society. And I I don't agree with that. I think that um, you know, when as you draw a distinction between ethnicity and and um, uh, and language. Evidence of language doesn't indicate for an ethnicity. And even a language can spread between different groups of people, as for example, the English language. There are lots of countries today which use the English language with, which aren't ethnically English and they you know, don't have anything to use with the English, but the languages can move. And in the late colonial era period, they didn't really see that the way we see it, you know? They thought that language moved with people. You know, I take, for instance, the Aryan invasion theory. You know, they always thought that if we have a language coming in, it means you have a conquering horde coming over and taking over. And that view is kind of outdated, you know, because languages are living things that can move around. And so I don't think it, it makes sense to identify language with ethnicity. And I don't think presence of Old Mon languages indicates towards the ethnicity of, or racial group or whatever of specific groups of people. But I also think, moreover, it doesn't necessarily indicate the language of which they were using. Now, when you talk about Mon and Khmer, um, I think that Mon certainly would have been a prestige language. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things that I would have liked to talk about, but I had to keep my presentation short. And one of the things I didn't talk about is language mixing. Because on the Korat Plateau, we see a lot of Khmer borrow words in Old Mon inscriptions. And even in the middle period, we see some on the central plain written in Old Mon. The miniature stupa I showed you, it has written in Bali and Old Mon, but it has an old Khmer word in there, you know. And so what we see is that, of course, around that same time, Khmer influence is spreading into the central plain and to the Kra Plateau, you know, primarily up the Mekong River and then across the, the Moon River Valley. And um, the, like, the tablets from Mahasarakam with the red ink writing, they have, like, Khmer words. The, the word for king is a Khmer word. But all the other words around it are all Mon words. Um, and so there is a, a matter of language mixing. And in a, in a way, it's kind of unique because just like when we see inscriptions in the language which take Bali and Sanskrit and mix them in a way that we don't find in India. In India, Bali inscriptions don't have Sanskrit per se, and Sanskrit don't have Bali. But in Southeast Asia, some inscriptions, they blurred the line a little bit and they'd mix them. Even the spelling, sometimes they would take a spelling and we find a hybrid spelling which isn't in Bali dictionaries or isn't in Sanskrit dictionaries. And so they have this merging of things which are foreign to their area. And in the Kura Plateau, we see that. We see a mixing. We see several um, Mon language inscriptions which have words or phrases borrowed from Old Khmer. And so definitely, I think it was a prestige language. That would also, to me, indicate, could be evidence that the Kura Plateau wasn't necessarily Mon speakers if they're willingly pulling Khmer language in. Something else to think about is that any areas where we have Khmer going into that area, they still had long texts that had narrative texts with lots of vocabulary and lots of things said, whereas these Mon inscriptions don't. 
And so it's kind of hard to really answer it because what we have is a lack of evidence. And part of that was for what they used the inscriptions for. The old Khmer inscriptions were used to record details, record you know, what was donated to a temple in terms of manpower and resources and something like that. The Mon inscriptions normally don't. They give us almost no detail. It's almost always just a personal name. They got merit. Sometimes they say what they got merit for, but usually they don't. And so we don't have much vocabulary. We don't have much narration. We don't have a lot of description. And so it's not really indicative of language usage necessarily. We might have the word merit and a couple of people's names. And so by the structure, we can identify it as Mon, but they're, they're not really showing us that they were using the language. And so it's hard to say, you know, but I certainly do think that it, it would have been a language of prestige which also might have been why it was important in as an ecclesiastic language, possibly. You know, um, it's also important to think about all of the, the artifacts that we find inscribed are all artifacts which are related to religious practices, which is kind of why I threw out the examples of the monks, is because clearly the old Mon language, we don't see it in the context of rulers and talking about their societies and what they built or something. It's all about religion. You know, and so we don't know if the ordinary people were or weren't using it. But I, I certainly think that any, you know, any of these major languages in the past would have been, you know, there would have been a matter of prestige in, in borrowing them and using them. But it, it's kind of hard to say, I think mostly because of the lack of evidence. Because there isn't much. You know, there are, there are not many inscriptions and they don't say very much. Does that help a little? Anyone else? Peter? Can I, um I think you made a strong case against uh, Varavati. Mm -hmm. It's uh, deeply problematic, limited evidence. Um, and I think you made uh, you made an interesting case about the dispersed evidence from Mon. Um, what I think, <laughs> apart from the, it, it, that's leading towards a void somewhat for me, mm -hmm. and yet. What is there is the culture, and that, I, I, I suspect you're underplaying the fact that you've got very powerful, uh, distinctive Buddhist culture, the Dharma Chakra wheels you've shown us, and the extension of that, that was Robert Brown's uh, position, that wherever you got that, you had this culture, whatever it was, we don't know the history, don't know the language, you don't really know much about it, but it was that, mm -hmm. and certainly with Khmer influence. Um, and I think the, I think Pina Endorf indicates the first Dharma Chakra was actually at Okeo mm -hmm. in in the Delta. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, and then you look at the scale of the buildings in Sitep, places <coughs> like this. It's not only Nakhon mm -hmm. It's 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 a it's a broad area of Mang Sema also mm -hmm. of, uh, of of a culture. Ex of, expressing itself in religious monuments of considerable size, implying uh, organization, uh, uh, funding, uh, uh, power, skill sets, uh, mm -hmm. all, all of that, which are still there despite your <laughs> sort of putting us into a void in terms of what the history of the place was, how it was tied up. But there is something very substantial there. Mm -hmm. Which, which uh, I suppose is better represented as Mon culture with Pali and uh, Sanskrit input and Khmer, but it's there, mm -hmm. and and to an extent it extends into Myanmar as well, mm -hmm. um, and possibly also to Kule. Um, so what are we doing with this uh, this culture where we're, we're, we've got problems with the with, with the culture? Uh, we don't have problems with the Buddhism. That's fairly consistent, uh, and the architecture and the art forms. Now the early Buddhist art <coughs> forms are, are fairly common across a bigger area than uh, what we've been showing us on the maps. But is, isn't there isn't there a culture there which? Um, uh, but maybe not a not a, a coherent culture, which the scarcity of language uh, is, is tends to undermine. I am 
not really decided on the case, but I've thought about a lot of the things that you've mentioned. Um, for example, um, Brown's study on Dharma chakras. Brown does tend to think that places where we find Dharma chakras are indicative, indicative of the same cultural sphere of Tawarawadi. But even Brown says that the Karat Plateau, he says it's related, but then he goes on to say that he doesn't think that it was culturally related to the Central Plain. As far as Pina Indorf's study of Dharma Chakras, I think her study is flawed for a couple reasons. Um, for one thing, the uh, she mentions evidence of Dharma Chakras at Simple or Pre Cook, and I've been there and looked at it, and it's not Dharma Chakras, it's just round objects. And there's no evidence, there's no hub, there's no spokes, it's not clearly a wheel. And if we look at Dharma chakras, there's three features they have to have, the hubs, the spokes, and the rim, the early feli. And the objects at Sempo Bray Cook, it's just round objects. And if you look at other monuments from Sempo Bray Cook, we find other round things with motifs in the center, which clearly aren't Dharma chakras. Uh, Indorf also mentions it at Okeo and at uh, Angkor Bore. Uh, and I've been and looked at both of those. We also have evidence from Southern Thailand, um, Peninsula region at Yarang and at, um, at Nakonsi Tamarat. Yes, at Nakonsi Tamarat. Um, there are chakras from Yarang and Nakonsi Tamarat, but they're laterate. Whereas all the ones on the central plain, um, most people say they're Sanskrit, uh, excuse me, sandstone. Um, um, Pasuk Intara Wood said they're actually argillite, which is a different type of stone, which is only found at the Dharma chakras on the Tuarabadi, what we call the Tuarabadi cultural sphere. Now, Indorf mentions the ones from Ok El and calls them Dharma Chakra. But if you look at them, they're not distinctively Dharma Chakra. They're just wheels. And Chakra are not used only in the context of Buddhism. Con the Chakra is also associated with Vishnu and with Hinduism. Um, and we find other symbolism of Chakras related to out of the Buddhist context, in the Hindu context of, of, of Vishnu. And like if you look at the one in Angkor Bure, it's very simple. In, in appearance. It has spokes and it has a hub, but it resembles nothing like the Dharma Chakra of Tauravati. And so the first thing is, it's not necessarily, Dharma Chakra is Buddhist, but it could be a chakra in a Hindu context, which would make it separate from the Dharma Chakras of Tauravati. Secondly, is as, as the point that Brown made, is that the, the uh, Tauravati Dharma Chakras, they're stylized by the motifs and like the ones that Indorf mentions at Oak Ale, they share none of the similarities of the ones from the Tuaravati cultural sphere. And so... The spokes. They have spokes, but if you, it's very simple. They're just white and it has a rim. And so it doesn't have like the decorative carvings and the, the flames around the outside or the, any of the distinct, distinctive features which Brown talks about of Tuaravati Dharma Chakras. The ones from Oak Ale don't have any of those features except for the, you know, it looks like a wheel. And so, arguably, it could be a wheel in a Hindu context. Um, for other stuff, I think that, and again, I'm not completely settled on this. I just try to propose that we have made assumptions that have gone ahead of ourselves without necessarily looking at it. Now, when we look at a lot of the context about the evidence we have, for example, CTEP you mentioned, some people think CTEP was Tuarawadi. Piriya Krayariksha argued that CTEP was Tuarawadi and that CTEP was the center of the Tuarawadi culture. Some people said Mungsema was the center, you know, and so these were all important sites. And again, we don't really know which one was Tawarawadi, and we don't know which one was the hub, but people tend to collectively pull them together without considering the splits or separations that there were in the styles. And another thing that I've noticed is that whenever scholars look at <clears throat> these cultural areas, they look at the statues, they look at the inscriptions, they look at the Dharma chakras and the votive tablets or the clay ceilings, depending on what you want to call. All of these are related to the religious culture, which was not only religious culture, they all would have been related to the elite culture. And they don't tell us very much about the common everyday people. And I think this is a big problem in scholars that have looked at Torah. They don't, for example, look at pottery. They don't look at metallurgy. Like the prehistoric archaeologists tend to look at things like pottery and metallurgy, and the historic archaeologists look at like statues and buildings and inscriptions. And this is important for me because actually when I started, I tended to have this idea that it was this cohesive thing until I started studying pottery. And I started studying especially about Pimai blackware pottery is what really struck my attention. Because I was interested in the pottery from Ban Chia, which is old. And if you read a lot of the early literature on Thai history, 
In the past, they tended to write off the Korat Plateau and said it was an underpopulated backwoods area until influence spread up from the Central Plain and from Cambodia. And that's what a lot of people still think, at least in Thailand. And um, if you look, for example, at Ban Chien pottery, they were not, they were an advanced culture a long time ago on the Korat Plateau. And then later, like the early first millennium, we have the Pimai Blackware, which is very technical, very nice pottery. And, but it's a different cultural sphere than we're seeing in the Sakonafon Basin, you know. And it's different from what we see to Warawadi pottery. Like all the pottery on the Central Plain, there are a lot of similarities between sites that's not similarities that we see repeated on the Korat Plateau. And so, and again, I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm saying that we have to look a little more broadly at the other types of evidence. We have to look at the beads. We have to look at what are the metallurgy sites? Where is this stuff coming from? What things were being traded? And we have to look at the pottery and we have to consider all these things together instead of just looking at like the religious art alone and trying to think that that can be indicative of the whole society in the past. And so, again, I'm not really arguing for one side or the other. I'm just saying that if you look at the literature, people kind of tended to jump the gun a little bit and jump to these conclusions without really looking at, at as many things as we should be looking at, I think. And it's difficult, you know. I think, again, when you talk about Mung Se Ma was a big one, Sitep was a big one. Well, we don't have any names. Even we have the name, we have Tawarawadi, we have Sri Chanasa. Some people think Mung Se Ma was Sri Chanasa. Some people think Mung Sitep uh, was Sri Chanasa. And I think that if we had names for all of these sites, which so far we don't, but it would be nice if we found more, uh, we may begin to say, oh, these were more r rivaling mandalas. You know, and there's also been a split in the past where people try to divide like the Buddhism versus Hinduism. And they say like the lower Mekong was Hindu and like the Western, you know, central plain of Thailand was Buddhism. But if we look in the Mekong Delta, we find plenty of Buddhist evidence. If we look in the Tuarwadi cultural sphere, even in the Kompotong, we see plenty of Hindu evidence. And so it's also a fallacy for us to try to make this Hindu-Buddhist divide because all of these societies had both Hinduism and Buddhism overplaying if one or the other may have been more dominant in, in a, any given place at a time. And so I just think we have to be reflective about the wider range of evidence and considering it's difficult, you know, because there's not a lot of material culture evidence that we have. There hasn't been a lot of excavations and a lot of the excavations which have been done in the past, they either weren't systematic or they weren't published properly. And for example, in Thailand, there are quite a bit of um, controlled excavations which have been published but they've been published in Thai and this stuff has never been translated into English. So it's only accessible to people who are literate in Thai and able to gain access to the, to the archives. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I know you talked about Thailand and the Hmong uh, findings there, but if you move over the border to Myanmar, um, it's not your specific field right now, but you must have looked at some of the Hmong inscriptions mm -hmm. and are they also similar? Are they all religions? Do they express the same things as in Thailand? Or if they are different, can we then think of there's a different relationship between the Mon inscriptions <laughs> from Myanmar and their relationship to the general populace? Um, that's a good question. The Mon inscriptions in Burma, we can kind of split them into three groups, at, uh, Begu, Began, and Taton. Um, and they're all dating kind of like later. Um, although there are some inscriptions in southern Burma that date as early as the 6th century, like the Kalkun cave inscription is probably about 6th century. The script looks very similar to the, the cave inscription at Saraburi, which we date to the 6th century. Um, the inscriptions at Bagan, um, we, you know, we assume that Bagan was a Burmese-speaking majority, you know, but early on they were using Mon as an epigraphic language. Perhaps at the time they had not, you know, formalized um, written Burmese. And so in the early period of Begon, they were writing long narrative text, some really multi-stone text, like one message would go from stone to stone to stone like this, written in Old Mon. And so it's actually interesting that we, the bulk majority of epigraphic evidence for Old Mon is actually in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it by groups who weren't even, you know, speaking Mon as their main vernacular. Uh, in southern Myanmar, we find um, uh, more, of course, Begon period is a little later. Taton period, there's, there's stuff... Uh, some inscriptions which date to an earlier period. One problem is that in Myanmar there's been less excavation, and so a lot of stuff that may be there, we don't know of it yet. Uh, and some of it has probably been looted out and gone into markets or stuff like that, so it hasn't really been properly documented. 
Um, but things get found even now continuously. You know, you'll see on Facebook or something where they're digging at a temple and they uncover a bunch of like votive tablets or something like that. So there actually is quite a bit of evidence for um, Old Mon in, in uh, Myanmar. A lot of it that I've seen, uh, like on tablets, for example, the content is quite similar to that we see in, in Old Mon inscriptions we found in Thailand. The structure of the script, the language is quite similar. Um, some people debate this because we know that the Mon language was present on both sides of the Tanao Sea range. And so, you know, some people in the past have tried to say, oh, all that was Tawana Wadi. Or there was something over here at the same time. Or maybe they started on this side and moved to that side. And all these things we can't really say because there, there just hasn't been enough research done in southern Burma yet. Um, but that's certainly something that now that Myanmar begins to open up, that's a topic that, that we need to look more into. And so hopefully in the future we'll, we'll have more information on that. Any other questions? Uh, we have the famous, the famous stone culture and the Tawarawati wheel culture. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you think? Do you think it's different? Do you just think that two totally different cultural centers that had this this one major expression of their religiosity? Or do you? I, I, think, I think that the point I'm making is that many scholars in the past have tried to look at similarities, for example, in the statuary and tried to consolidate the central plane and the Karapla to as a single cohesive group. And I'm not convinced of that. And one of the reasons I don't think that is because the Tawarawi Dharma Chakras, we don't find them dispersed across the Karapla Plateau. And the same stones, we don't find them dispersed across the central plain. A point I didn't get to make here was that a lot of the, not a lot, a good number of the same stones on the Karat Plateau and at Phnom Kulen, they actually have Dharma chakras on them. And so the Dharma chakra was an artistic motif. It shows that there was, was connectivity and, and cultural sharing of ideas between the two regions. But what we don't find is a lot of Dharma chakras, like Tuarwadi style, carved stones on the Karat Plateau, and we don't find... Too, right? Reportedly. Yeah. Well, at the very, at the yeah. south, the southwest corner, we find several yeah. in Mung Se Ma area. And then reportedly, there was one from, from Galicia in the center of the plateau, but that's not confirmed, and it's only one. And so it's certainly indicative of connection, but I don't think it's enough evidence to necessarily say that it was a single society or anything like that. Anyone else? There is no no other language apparent. Mm -hmm. It's on your questioning <coughs> um, whether that was a liturgical language or a, um, a, 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 a widely used language throughout this huge space. Um, but there's no sign of any other. My, minor ones, perhaps in, in, in communities in the in mountainous areas, but not on the plain. In mountainous areas, I don't know of any inscriptions anyways. The inscriptions were being produced by the, the lowland populations, um, and we don't find any other regional languages, any other local Southeast Asian languages, aside from on until Khmer appears. So no, only Mon. And, um, and again, but some people take that as indicative of a vernacular and of a consolidated society. And I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I don't think that it, it's an assumption we can make immediately based on the evidence. The main reason being because most of these inscriptions are so short. And so I don't think it's necessarily possible to make assumptions about the society based on such short messages and such scattered out. Like many of these locations on the Karat Plateau, there may be only one or two. Like one or two Sama stones that have one line on them. And so the point that I'm making is that although they may have been Mon speakers there, that alone shouldn't be enough evidence for all of us to just immediately accept that they were Mon or that it was a Mon society or that they were Mon vernacular. The problem I have, again, I'm not saying they weren't. I'm just saying that I think we get ahead of ourselves by assuming that they were based on the limited amount of evidence that we have. So, I'm just wondering if, um, 
So the work that Peter Stilling has been doing is recently distinguishing between compositional palette and liturgical palette, for example. If that correlates at all to the kinds of to the ways that you're attempting to look at this, I'm thinking in particular about the, the compositional category, mm -hmm. which in some ways you're suggesting that compositional um, conveys or reflects vernacular usage. Certainly not the case with Sanskrit in ancient Cambodia. Mm -hmm. It's compositional. Mm -hmm. Pali is not compositional in ancient Cambodia. So neither of them reflect vernacular usage. Right? They reflect very different relationships to the language. Mm -hmm. um, so when Peter Stilling is looking at the use of Pali, an ecclesiastical use still, no matter what, mm -hmm. under that large umbrella, one dimension or one mode is compositional and the other is, is, um, is liturgical or citational mm -hmm. and or. Um, none of that reflects vernacular usage. Does that map in some ways onto how you're thinking about modern usage? Well, and the way it could reflect on my idea is that it's possible for us to then look at areas where we find old Khmer language and say, were those areas okay. Khmer people or Khmer populations, and was Khmer the vernacular in those places? Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I like to turn to the Khmer example more to draw attention to the lack that we find in Old Mon text. Um, of course, I think there's a fallacy in, in looking at the Khmer world. You know, I think that a lot of the literature tends to talk about sites as being Khmer populations, you know, or Khmer centers. And when we read things like that, I think that there's an there's a tendency to overlook or to forget about minority populations and minority languages, which most certainly would have been present. You know, um, even like a Gulen, you know, I think the Khmer records mentioned that there was some other minority group, I don't remember the name now, that was living on Gulen in the early period. So it certainly wasn't like a consolidated, you know, single linguistic group. There would have been minority groups. And so then, yeah, even if the, the Khmers expanded their power and influence, the places they went to, it wouldn't have been everyone in society speaking Khmer. It may have been only a small group of people in the ruling class, and then, of course, the religious class, you know, the, uh, the ascetics or the monks or whatever like that. And so um, so I think we can actually turn that and look back to Khmer's and ask the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we left you with all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of unanswered questions, yes. Yeah. So thank you, Hector, for your <coughs> presentation today. I think for everybody to join us. And uh, we're going to have this event again on um, 20th November. So next week we don't have, but next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.